Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar where, where uh, we will address issues at the intersection of bankruptcy and intellectual property law. Uh, I'm David Kupitz. I'm a partner with the law firm Solmeyer Kupitz. Our primary focus is on business reorganization, financial restructuring, bankruptcy, and insolvency matters and related transactions and litigation. Conflicts arise at the point where intellectual property or IP law and bankruptcy law intersect. This results in issues requiring special consideration in bankruptcy cases involving intellectual property assets. And these issues uh, spring in large part from the conflicting goals of bankruptcy and intellectual property law. In bankruptcy, we have a primary goal of maximizing the value of the bankruptcy estate. In Chapter 11 reorganization cases, there's also the goal of rehabilitation of the debtor. That's the case even though many Chapter 11 cases these days and in recent years have actually uh, taken the form of a liquidation through a going concern uh, sale, frequently effectuated through what's called Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code or some other type of transaction that doesn't actually result in rehabilitation. But the primary bankruptcy goal uh, is maximizing the value of the bankruptcy estate. Intellectual property law has a number of goals and copy, copyright and patent protection are designed to encourage creative authorship and, and, and invention. Trademark protection is intended to protect the public's expectation regarding the source and quality of goods. But the sort of overriding general goal of intellectual property law can be viewed as protecting a party's right to control access to its intellectual property. Now taking a step back for a couple of minutes, it's important to understand some rather basic and general bankruptcy concepts. Uh, the entity that commences a bankruptcy case is referred to as the debtor. In Chapter 11, there's what's called either a debtor in possession where management remains in place and continues to run the company as a debtor in possession, or there's a bankruptcy trustee, which uh, is an outside uh, fiduciary who may be appointed by the court, generally only in circumstances where there's special cause for, for appointment, whether it's uh, gross mismanagement, not just mismanagement, severe conflicts of interest, fraud, dishonesty, that kind of thing. The presumption is against the trustee in a Chapter 11 case. In this presentation, I'll refer to the debtor in possession as the debtor. Um, the filing of a bankruptcy petition triggers the creation of an estate, the bankruptcy estate, that in includes all of the debtor's property interests, including contract rights. When the petition is filed, when a bankruptcy case is commenced, an automatic stay springs into effect that stops all actions against the debtor, or virtually all actions, including termination of contracts without the prior permission of the bankruptcy court. So it's up to the bankruptcy court to decide whether to uh, modify or lift the automatic stay. Now turning to some general concepts um, under intellectual property law. Uh, patents are governed by uh, federal law, the Patent Act, and cover inventions and discoveries very broadly. This includes devices, methods, processes, articles of manufacture, machines, compositions of matter, and improvements. So it's a very broad protection for inventions and discoveries. Copyright, also governed by federal law, the Federal Copyright Act, protects original works of authorship, including books and other written works, songs, movies, artwork, technical drawings, and architectural works. Trademark involves uh, protection of um, words, phrases, symbols, and designs, or any combination thereof that are trademarks, and they're used to identify and distinguish goods uh, from goods of others. And again, it's federal law that governs. So intellectual property uh, law is basically federal law. And in the case of trademarks, it's what's called the Lanham Act. Um, all three types of, of intellectual property that we're primarily focused on here are governed by federal law. The bankruptcy code itself is an implicit part of every contract. Most of us out in the world who aren't bankruptcy lawyers 
uh, don't perceive things that way, but it is the case. Uh, contract rights are generally governed by state law or in some instances, such as cases involving intellectual property, are governed by non-bankruptcy federal law. The bankruptcy code itself does not determine the existence and scope of a debtor's interest in property. That's generally going to be determined based on rights that the debtor holds under uh, state law or non-bankruptcy federal law in the case of uh, uh, intellectual property rights, for example. The bankruptcy code was designed to allow a debtor to elect to discontinue performance under a burdensome contract, that's called rejection, while permitting the debtor to force the other party to continue to perform under a contract valuable to the bankruptcy estate, and that would be assumption. So in a bankruptcy context, the debtor has uh, the ability to perform contracts, to consume them and continue, or to breach contracts, which is what happens um, in the case of rejection, and we're talking about pre-bankruptcy contracts. Subject to court approval, a debtor may assume, so uh, continue with and perform the contract, or it may assume and assign, assume the contract and assign it or transfer it to a third party, or reject the contract. And these contracts that the debtor has the power to assume, assume and assign or reject are executory contracts. So it's limited, this power is limited to executory contracts, and that's been defined as contracts um, for where performance to some material degree remains on both sides of the agreement. So both parties to the contract have material obligations that remain to be performed. And the standard in a bankruptcy case for the debtor uh, assuming, assuming and assigning or rejecting an, uh, an executory contract is generally a relatively low threshold. The debtor can do these things subject to court approval as long as uh, the debtor is exercising reasonable business judgment in uh, moving forward and requesting the court's approval for assumption, assumption and assignment or rejection of an executory contract. The debtor generally has the ability to sell its assets and again to assume, assume and assign or reject its contracts, and that's re executory contracts, regardless of any contractual provisions that restrict or prevent such actions. So the bankruptcy law generally is going to override those contractual provisions that might prevent the debtor from being able, for example, to assign an executory contract. The debtor's decision to sell, assume, assume and assign or reject is subject to, again, this relatively low threshold, reasonable exercise of business judgment and court approval. In general, a debtor in default under an executory contract may nonetheless assume the contract if the debtor, one, cures or provides adequate assurance that it will promptly cure any defaults under the contract, two, compensates or provides adequate assurance of prompt compensation for any monetary loss of the other party resulting from a default under the, the executory contract, and third, provides adequate assurance of future performance under the executory contract. Now, assumption of an executory contract may become more complicated where non-monetary defaults are involved. And generally, the courts have looked at that by examining the materiality and the economic significance of the default uh, as the measure of, of whether the debtor may assume the contract, even in the face of these non-monetary defaults that sometimes are not curable. In general, once a contract can be assumed, it can be assigned, so transferred to a third party subject to that third party providing adequate assurance of future performance. So the assignee needs to be able to provide adequate assurance of future performance. Now there's going to be some exceptions to these general concepts that I'll discuss, discuss in a few minutes in the cases of uh, intellectual property and executory contracts involving intellectual property. Parties seeking, par parties to executory contracts seeking to protect their interests in the event of a future bankruptcy by the other party to the contract should carefully consider the, the default language in the agreement and may desire to establish material non-monetary default provisions 
that may be incurable in order to prevent assumption and or assignment of an agreement over the party's objection. So there's some drafting approaches and strategies that, that parties can engage in if they're focused on uh, the reality that ultimately a bankruptcy could be at issue and the best way to protect themselves in the event of a future bankruptcy. In preparing license agreements on behalf of either a licensee or a licensor, consideration should be uh, given to defining what constitutes adequate assurance of future performance if the licensee, if the license was to be assigned to a third party in connection with a bankruptcy case. So it's a matter of uh, thinking forward and um, contemplating what could happen in the event of bankruptcy. Now turning to rejection of executory contracts. Rejection of an executory contract that was not previously assumed constitutes a breach of the contract relating back to the date immediately preceding the filing of the debtor's bankruptcy petition. What this results in is a claim um, that becomes a pre-petition unsecured claim, which must be presented through the ordinary claims administration process. In contrast, if an, if an executory contract is, is assumed in a bankruptcy case and then is subsequently breached, the resulting claim is, is an administrative expense claim of the bankruptcy estate. And the, that's significant because administrative expense claims get paid off the top. They're much higher priority than a pre-petition general unsecured claim. Taking uh, a second to consider the effect of rejection. When a debtor rejects an executory contract, and this excludes intellectual property contracts where the debtor is a licensor, which we're going to take talk about a little bit later in the, in the uh, program. Most courts hold that the other party to the contract is limited to asserting a claim for damages resulting from the breach and generally is unable to simply cannot compel further performance of the debtor. Uh, again, the resulting claim is a general unsecured claim that's paid in what sometimes re is referred to as bankruptcy dollars. And those frequently amount to a small fraction of the amount of the claim, so they may be getting pennies on the dollar. Intellectual property agreements are, are most frequently found to be executory contracts. Courts have found patent, copyright, and trademark license agreements to be executory contracts. IP licenses are almost always viewed as executory contracts unless, and this is significant, the license constitutes an assignment, so an outright transfer, or uh, one side has completely performed its obligations under the contract, so it's no longer an executory contract. An IP license that is exclusive uh, may be deemed to be an assignment. It may be viewed as an outright transfer of ownership uh, in some circumstances and may not be an executory contract, and we'll discuss that some more again a little bit later. Intellectual property that is completely owned by the debtor and where the debtor has not licensed that property to another party should really be unaffected by a bankruptcy filing. There shouldn't be any special limitations that come into play. And these IP rights may be retained by the debtor or they may be sold. Um, exclusive copyright licenses, for example, under copyright law are transfers of copyright ownership, uh, which should be treated as executory contracts and should be freely assignable without the other restrictions that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes that that can exist in a bankruptcy case. However, um, there are some courts that have disagreed with that view, and I'll mention those in a, in a little while. Courts have found that where a license confers complete control to a licensee, uh, the license is not an executory contract since at least one of the parties has no further obligations under what in essence is a sale or assignment agreement. An important area to look at is what happens in a bankruptcy case where the debtor is the licensor um, and the debtor elects to reject the license agreement. What are the rights of a non-debtor licensee? This arose in a case called Lubrizol um, coming out of the Fourth Circuit in the mid-80s. And that court held, and that was the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, that a technology debtor licensor could unilaterally reject its license agreement and eliminate the right of the non-debtor licensee to use the intellectual property. The intellectual property community reacted very uh, severely to this. They found that this was going to be chilling uh, 
the licensing of intellectual property, and the, uh, they sought special protection for intellectual property licensees um, from Congress. And in response, Congress enacted Section 365N of the Bankruptcy Code in 1988 to protect licensees of intellectual property. And trademarks were not explicitly included, which has led to some interesting uh, issues that, that, that we'll discuss in a couple of minutes. Trademark licensees that desire the protection of this provision should make sure that their license agreement states that the parties agree that Section 365N shall apply in the event of the licensor's bankruptcy. Under Section 365N, the non-debtor licensee has options if the debtor elects to reject the license. Non-debtor licensee can treat the license as terminated if, if uh, rejection would constitute a breach outside of bankruptcy or it can retain its rights under the agreement to use the licensed intellectual property for the duration of the contract period and for any extension periods under the contract. If the non-debtor licensee chooses to continue to, to use the licensed technology despite the rejection of the license, there's, there's things that follow from that. First, the licensee must continue to pay royalties to the licensor. There can, issues can arise as to what are royalties. Um, drafting suggestions can include, from the licensor's perspective, having a broad definition of royalties or trying to draft into the license agreement that certain fees and other things that might not ordinarily be construed as royalties are to be treated as royalties under Section 365N of the Bankruptcy Code if that arises. And, and that drafting may or may not hold up in the event of a bankruptcy case, but it's, it, it can be worth the effort. Second, the licensee waives any right to set off in any administrative claim. And third, the debtor licensor is required to allow the licensee access um, to the IP. So this is a significant change from the Lubrizol kind of scenario, where the IP could basically be stripped out from under the licensee. What Section 365N still does is it allows the licensor to eliminate any ongoing affirmative obligations. So while it does not prevent the intellectual property licensee's continued use of the property, it permits the licensor to avoid the continued performance of affirmative obligations under the agreement. And these might include things like um, the obligation to train the licensee's personnel to provide marketing or promotional functions, technical service, product service, maintenance functions, defense against infringement or other obligations. So those affirmative obligations can be eliminated and that allows a debtor licensor to uh, get out from under those obligations, although um, Section 365N prevents the licensee from having the um, IP stripped out from under it. In the context of uh, trademarks, the question becomes, does 365N and the protection that it provides to licensees even apply? Because 365N in the Bankruptcy Code includes a definition of intellectual property um, that governs the scope of 365N, and it doesn't include uh, trademarks. It, 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 it refers to patents, copyrights, and trade secrets, but does not mention trademarks. As a result, many courts have, have found that the right of licensees to continue to use trademarks following rejection is simply not available, that the protection of 365N under the Bankruptcy Code just doesn't apply. However, in the uh, Sunbeam case, the Seventh Circuit found the opposite. The court there addressed the impact of rejection of a trademark license agreement uh, on the non-debtor licensee, and in this 2012 decision, the Seventh Circuit recognized that rejection constitutes a breach of the contract, but that it, but found that the licensor's breach does not terminate the licensee's right to use the IP. After rejection, uh, the debtor could not be subject to an order of specific performance, but the debtor's unfulfilled obligations are converted to damages. This is how the Seventh Circuit looked at it, and the licensee's other rights are not vaporized. So the licensee 
under the Seventh Circuit's view, doesn't even need the trademark licensee, need the protection of Section 365N, because under uh, non-bankruptcy federal law, it would have the right to continue to use the IP. Um, and that continues to apply. The Crumbs Bake Shop case, which was a 2014 decision um, out of a bankruptcy court in New Jersey, also found that trademark licensees can be protected by Section 365 and despite the omission of trademarks from the bankruptcy code's definition of IP. Now turning to situations where the debtor is the licensee. This is a very interesting area that's governed by bankruptcy code section 365, 365C. Where the debtor has licensed IP from another party intellectual property law and the bankruptcy and bankruptcy code section 365c may prevent the debtor from assuming and or assigning the license without the licensor's consent now section 365c only precludes assumption or assignment of the license where prohibited by applicable non-bankruptcy law so in this case it would be intellectual property law which is federal and where there's no consent to assignment in the license agreement itself if the license agreement has an authorization in, it, in, it, in itself in advance authorizing assignment, then there's no issue. Accordingly, it's important that close attention should be given to drafting provisions and license agreements that provide or decline to provide consent to assignment. Courts are split on how to interpret Section 365C. Uh, Again, this governs how um, debtor licensees what their rights are in an intellectual property bankruptcy case and the courts are applying different tests the first test uh, which has been applied by the majority of circuit courts of appeal that have addressed the issue is, is what's called the hypothetical test and this test interprets section 365 C to mean that where the applicable law again that's going to be uh, federal uh, intellectual property law, whether it's patent or trademark or copyright, where the applicable law bars assignment of the underlying agreement, both assumption and assignment are prohibited. So it prevents both assumption and assignment if the applicable law bars assignment. And this test has been applied by the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit and the Third Circuit. So a vast majority of the circuit courts that have addressed this issue have applied the hypothetical test. And under the hypothetical test, a debtor may not assume an executory contract over the non-debtor's um, objection. So if you have a debtor licensee who's seeking to assume the executory contract over the licensor's uh, objection, it can't be done if the applicable law, whether it's patent, copyright, or trademark, would prevent assignment to a hypothetical third party, even where, even where the debtor has no intention of assigning the contract, or the debtor just wants to continue with that contract. Now turning to the second test or approach, which has been labeled the actual test. This is the approach that's followed by a minority of circuit courts of appeal. Under the actual test, the court conducts a case-by-case -case inquiry into whether the debtor in the particular case intends to assign the executory contract. If assignment is not contemplated, the applicable non-bankruptcy law isn't taken into consideration and, and wouldn't prevent assumption. Now the actual test has been followed by the first and the fifth circuits and under the test the right to assign is restricted but not right not the right to assume. It's interesting to note that the majority of lower courts in reported decisions have taken the view that the actual test should be applied in construing the statutory language in order to permit assumption where the debtor in possession does not intend to assign the contract but again so far, at least, the majority of courts of appeal that have addressed the issue have followed the hypothetical test. Now, turning to the third approach, which has been labeled the Footstar approach, and this name comes from a, a case, a bankruptcy case out of the Southern District of New York called In Re Footstar. In that case, um, the court found that the limitation of Section 365C of the Bankruptcy Code doesn't apply to a debtor in possession and looked very specifically at the statutory language that referred to a trustee and not a debtor in possession. And again, in most Chapter 11 cases, uh, 
a trustee isn't appointed, certainly not early in the case. It's a debtor in possession with management in place uh, that continues. Um, there's no binding authority in the Second Circuit uh, where the New York bankruptcy courts are located. Uh, uh, there's no binding uh, appellate level authority. The bankruptcy courts in that circuit have adopted an approach in the Southern District of New York that if other bankruptcy courts um, have made a decision on an issue, they'll tend to follow that decision, even though it's not necessarily binding precedent. So it appears at this point that in the Southern District of New York, it's the foot, foot star approach um, that governs, which is interesting because in the bankruptcy code in general, it's generally viewed that a debtor in possession has pretty much all the rights, powers, duties, and obligations of a trustee. And here under the foot star approach, that's separated. Uh, and the debtor in possession uh, is not um, limited by Section 365C, where a trustee would be. It's important to note that consent is the overriding issue here in connection with Section 365C under the Bankruptcy Code. If a license agreement includes a provision that allows a licensee to assign its rights and the license to a third party, the license may be assumed and assigned in a bankruptcy case in Section 365 C is not even implicated, just doesn't come into play. Now, consent itself uh, can come up in three primary ways. The first is a license agreement that contains express um, consent, where that expressly permits assignment either on, in, in general or under certain circumstances, such as pursuant to a provision that allows assignment in connection with the sale of all or substantially all of the assets of the licensee. A second way consent can be provided is a license, uh, a licensor affirmatively consenting to assignment in writing after a bankruptcy case has been commenced. And the third way is that that a motion can be filed in the bankruptcy case to assign the license. And if the licensor fails to object after a properly noticed motion has been filed with the bankruptcy court seeking to assume and assign the license agreement, uh, that can be deemed to be implicit consent. Now you can have issues though of notice, adequate notice and due process in the Crumbs Bake Shop case, which I'll discuss a little bit uh, more later. Um, there was a sale free and clear of license rights, or at least in a, an attempt to do so. And the court just found that the motion itself and the related notice didn't provide licensees with adequate notice. And therefore, um, they were not going to be deemed to have impliedly consented. There's a recent decision, it's a 2015 decision out of a Delaware bankruptcy court in the Trump Entertainment Resorts case, which involved uh, casinos in Atlantic City, um, that addresses the application of Section 365C to trademarks. Uh, in that case, there was a trademark license agreement that had been originally entered by Donald and Ivanka Trump with three entities that operated these hotel casinos in Atlantic City. Um, the bankruptcy court looking at it found that in order for Section 365C and its limitations to apply, the applicable non-bankruptcy law, again we're talking about trademark law here, must specifically provide that the contracting party is excused from accepting performance from a third party that the licensor is excused from accepting performance from a third party under circumstances where it was clear from the statute that the identity of the licensee was crucial to the contract. So you have the court applying federal trademark law and the, the court found there that the substantial weight of authority holds that under federal trademark law, trademark licenses are not assignable in the absence of some express authorization from the licensor, such, such as a clause in the license agreement itself. The court held that the federal trademark law generally bans assignment of trademark licenses absent the licensor's consent because in order to ensure that all the products bearing its trademark are of uniform quality, the identity of, a, of the licensee is crucially important to the licensor. So as a result, the court found, and this is in the Trump case, that a trademark license agreement, the one at issue there, was not assignable under applicable non-bankruptcy law, again, trademark law since the identity of the licensee was crucial to the agreement and accordingly applying the hypothetical test, which is what uh, is the test in the Third Circuit where the Delaware courts 
are located, Delaware bankruptcy courts, the agreement was not assumable, assumable or assignable under Section 365C of the Bankruptcy Code. This resulted in the court granting relief from the automatic state of the licensor to continue some pre-bankruptcy state court litigation that had been brought to terminate the license. So litigation had been brought in accordance with the license agreement to terminate the license. It's interesting in particular because in the Trump case, the debtor had proposed but had not yet confirmed a Chapter 11 plan. Now that plan contemplated a cancellation of pre-existing equity, a nominal distribution to unsecured creditors, a debt for equity swap involving the debtor's lender, and did not contemplate any uh, significant asset transfer. The plan provided for the assumption of the trademark license agreement that was at issue. And what the Trump case in part at least highlights is the significance of choice of venue for Chapter 11 filings for companies that are licensees of intellectual property. In that case, if the debtor had filed, in a, in a, if it had been able to and had filed in a jurisdiction that, that did not apply the hypothetical test, it would not have been prevented by Section 365C from assuming the trademark license agreement under the plan and Trump would not have been granted relief from the automatic stay. So we either under the actual test or the footstar test, the result in this decision would have been different. Under the actual test, if the assignment, if assignment is not contemplated, as was the case in, in the Trump situation, the applicable non-bankruptcy law is simply not implicated and, and can't prevent assumption. Under the actual test, it's the right to the right to assign is restricted, but not the right to assume. And in the Trump case, they weren't even contemplating assignment. Alternatively, in the Trump case, if the debtor had negotiated language in the license agreement, con consenting to its assumption in, in bankruptcy upon satisfaction of the requirements of Section 365, other than Section 365C, the debtor would not have been precluded from assuming the agreement under the plan. So there potentially could have been a drafting fix if it had been entered up front. Now turning to some issues relating to a copyright and the assignment of copyrights. There are instances where a copyright license may not be an executory contract. The Copyright Act specifically defines the transfer of copyright ownership to include an exclusive copyright license. So you have a definition in the non-bankruptcy federal law of the transfer of copyright ownership as an assignment, mortgage, exclusive license, or any other conveyance, alienation, uh, hypothecation of a copyright, or any of the exclusive rights comprised in a copyright, whether or, whether or not it is limited in time or place of effect, but not including a non-exclusive license. So you've got this issue with respect to exclusive copyright licenses that it is defined under copyright law as an outright transfer of ownership. A copyright license is deemed to be exclusive where the licensor cannot issue additional licenses and does not retain the right to control the copyrighted material. Under the plain language of the Copyright Act, it, it, it suggests that exclusive copyright licenses convey an ownership interest of the licensed copyright, and consequently, licensees should be able to transfer such licenses. Nonetheless, bankruptcy courts are split on whether exclusive copyright licenses may be assigned without consent. Some courts have held that a license holding an exclusive that a licensee holding an exclusive copyright license may may transfer the license without the consent of the copyright owner because the provisions of the Copyright Act grant the holder of an exclusive license all of the rights and protections of the copyright owner. And this, this approach has been taken by the bankruptcy court in the Golden Books case, which is a Delaware bankruptcy de decision, also the bankruptcy court in the Southern District of New York in a case called Patient Education Media. In contrast, there's other courts that have disagreed uh, holding that even an exclusive copyright license is not assignable without the licensor's consent unless there's an express provision in the agreement to the contrary. And that actually, that, the leading decision in that, taking that view, which seems to be the wrong view, is a decision out of the Ninth Circuit 
called Gardner vs. Nike at 279 F3rd 774. And commentators have noted that that holding is flatly in conflict with the leading tre treatise on copyright law, which is Nimmer on copyright, and other leading bankruptcy cases. Now turning to the question of perfection of security interests in intellectual property. And historically, there's been a good deal of uncertainty and some inconsistency with regard to the question of perfecting security interests in different types of intellectual property. And the question uh, generally centers around whether perfection is to be accomplished under state law, which is the way perfection of security interests in most personal property is accomplished. And that's done through the Uniform Commercial Code, which has then been adopted by the various states throughout the country. And Article 9 governs the perfection of security interests. Or with respect to intellectual property, is perfection governed by the specific patent, trademark, or copyright law that applies? Um, the significance is that if a security interest is not perfected, it can be avoided. That basically means eliminated in a bankruptcy case through the use of the strong arm powers that a debtor in possession or bankruptcy trustee can utilize under Bankruptcy Code Section 544. The significance there is that um, an unperfected security interest or one that is avoidable and rendered unperfected um, basically puts the creditor who presumably thought they were a secured creditor and had specific rights with respect to their collateral uh, in the pool of unsecured creditors where frequently the recovery is going to be very, very minimal. Um, uh, and therefore, it's very significant for a creditor to make sure they've perfected their security interest. It's not enough just to have been granted a security interest. Intellectual property is included in the Uniform Commercial Code's definition of general intangibles that appears in Section 9102. Um, and under the UCC, the perfection of a security interest in general intangibles is accomplished through the filing of a financing statement. The financing statement is to be filed in the state uh, if it's a corporation at issue where the corporation uh, borrower or debtor is incorporated. With respect to perfecting a security interest in intellectual property assets, it, uh, it does become important to consider federal law since IP rights are governed by federal statutes. So with respect to patents, you have the Federal Patent Act. With respect to copyrights, it's the Copyright Act, again, federal law. And trademarks, it's the Lanham Act, again, federal law. And that law must be reviewed in determining how to best perfect a security interest in specific intellectual property. With, res with respect to patents, the Ninth Circuit has held that patent, the Patent Act does not preempt the Uniform Commercial Code or state law with respect to perfection of a security interest in a patent. And then filing a financing statement pursuant to Article 9, that's state law is sufficient to accomplish perfection. And that's uh, that appears in the cybernetic services case, which um, is reported at 252 F3rd 1039. That's the Ninth Circuit decision. In that case, the Ninth Circuit distinguished between assignments, so outright transfers, and security interests, and held that because a particular section of the Patent Act provides that only an assignment, grant, or conveyance shall be void against subsequent purchasers if not filed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that's the USPTO, as against subsequent purchasers and mortgagees. Only those transfers of ownership interest need to be recorded with the USPTO. So the Ninth Circuit was saying, hey, the Patent Act requires recordation of transfers and assignments, but doesn't require recordation of security interests, and therefore uh, filing a, a financing statement, which is the way to perfect a security interest under Article 9 state law, is adequate. However, the best approach, 
since the U.S. Supreme Court has not addressed this issue and as a matter of caution, is that secure parties should not only file a financing statement pursuant to Article 9 with the appropriate location under state law, but should also file the underlying security agreement with the USPTO. If it contains confidential information, that should not be included. It should be redacted because it's going to be a public filing. But that should be done uh, as a protective measure. Next, turning to trademark perfection. Federal law governs it's the Lanham Act. And like the, Pan the Patent Act, the Lanham Act only references the recordation of transfers of ownership interest. So it doesn't contain specific provisions governing um, perfection of security interests. And the bankruptcy courts have held that a UCC financing statement must be filed with the appropriate state authority to perfect the security interest in trademarks. There's a number of decisions that have held that over the years, uh, in, including a decision out of uh, uh, the Massachusetts Bankruptcy Court in a case called NRA Together Development Corp. and out of the Central District of California Bankruptcy Court in the case called uh, NRA 199Z. Um, while the Lanham Act has not been found to pre preempt Article 9, the filing of a financing statement pursuant to Article 9 uh, and also a filing with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office confirming the secured party's perfection of a security interest is advisable. It's just This is an area of law where you don't want to be found after the fact to have uh, made a mistake. And these are issues that have not been fully litigated all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. So there's room for some uncertainty, and it's important um, to not take the risk of just filing in one place. That would, that would be the uh, advice that, that counsel should provide. With respect to copyright perfect, perfection, copyrights are governed by the Copyright Act, again, federal law. And the Copyright Act has been held to establish a uniform method for recording security interests and copyrights. This came out of uh, a case called In Re Peregrine Entertainment back in 1990 in the Central District of California, where Judge Kaczynski, who's, who was already back then sitting uh, at the Court of Appeals was sitting by designation of a, uh, as a district court judge in an appeal from a bankruptcy court decision. And in the Peregrine case, he held that the Copyright Act, unlike the Patent Act or the Lanham Act for trademarks, preempted perfection of a security interest under state law, um, Article 9. So it wasn't going to be adequate just to record uh, a UCC financing statement under state law to perfect the security interest. Now, Subsequently, this Peregrine, Peregrine decision has been limited by the Ninth Circuit to registered copyrights in a case called In Re World Auxiliary Power Co., which is at 303 F3rd uh, 1120. Um, accordingly, filing with the Copyright Office is mandatory under Ninth Circuit law for registered copyrights in order for perfection of a security interest. Again, the cautious approach is to make filings in both the Copyright Office um, just like uh, in the USPTO for uh, trademarks and for patents and in the appropriate state location under Article 9 in order to perfect a security interest in copyrights. Even though the state, you know, the state filing is not required under Ninth Circuit law, at least with respect to registered copyrights. So really the takeaway here is since the US Supreme Court has not weighed in on these issues and since there are potentially conflicting statutes governing perfection, the belt and suspenders approach is best. Record in state and federal offices. Make sure that uh, you don't make the mistake there of, of just choosing one over the other. Next, turning to forfeiture provisions, or what are sometimes referred to as ipso facto provisions that appear in contracts. The bankruptcy code generally invalidates these provisions that would deprive a debtor of use and benefit of property as a result of bankruptcy. Those ipso facto provisions are, are generally just completely overruled and eliminated. And it's broader than just bankruptcy because the bankruptcy code was drafted to prevent parties in a contract from trying to contract around that by having the trigger for these forfeiture provisions be the debtor's financial condition. So it's not just bankruptcy, it's the debtor's financial condition, the commencement of a bankruptcy case, or the appointment or taking uh, possession by a bankruptcy trustee or a custodian before the commencement of the case. So a custodian, for example, would be a receiver. So if a pre-bankruptcy, if a receiver is appointed, and if that would um, trigger uh, 
a forfeiture provision in the contract, that's not going to be enforceable in the event of a subsequent bankruptcy case. These ipso facto provisions, again, they're generally provisions that provide for forfeiture. That the, can be the automatic termination or modification of a right under the contract um, or the right to terminate or modify in the event of bankruptcy or one, or one of these other conditions, basically rendered unenforceable. Now, Bankruptcy Code Section 365E2, however, can be construed as allowing ipso facto provisions to function with regard to executory contracts that are not assignable under Section 365C. That's what we discussed earlier with respect to restrictions on licensees. But in any event, the automatic stay of the bankruptcy case would, would still uh, apply, and there's no automatic uh, enforcement, even under this potential loophole, uh, the party would have to go to the bankruptcy court and get relief from the automatic stay. The conventional view, regardless, is that ipso facto clauses in an intellectual property license do not allow the termination of the license during the pendency of a Chapter 11 case in which the debtor remains in possession and no assignment of the IP license has been made. A licensee in a bankruptcy case can continue to use the IP as a debtor in possession without moving to assume, assign, or reject the IP uh, license because as an, as an executory contract, the IP license remains in effect during the period in which the debtor licensee is determining how to proceed and um, the automatic stay would preclude termination. So sometimes in a, in a bankruptcy case, there's sort of this limbo period where the debtor may be assuming what to do or not to do with respect to the license agreement, and the license would remain in effect during that period. It's also worth noting that in addition to assume, potentially um, having the options of assuming, number one, assuming and assigning, number two, or rejecting an executory contract, a license agreement, for example, it's possible for, for that kind of agreement, for an executory contract to not be addressed at all and potentially to ride through a bankruptcy case. Now, this would be quite unusual, and it would be perceived as risky, but there is case law out there where if a contract is not addressed one way or the other, even in the Chapter 11 plan, it is deemed to ride through the process and be unaffected if it's an executory contract. And I think the case law really isn't uniform on that, and in any kind of diligent case, uh, unless something slipped through the cracks, which might lead to the conclusion that the case wasn't being handled di diligently, uh, there's the, by the time a plan is confirmed or pursuant to the plan itself, executory contracts are either going to be assumed, assumed and assigned, or rejected. An interesting issue arose in the 2014 case of Inray Crumbs Bake Shop, where there was a sale free and clear of liens and interests under Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code. And the question arose, can that sale be free and clear of licensee rights, regardless of Section 365 and 365N? In that case, the Bankruptcy Court found that the licensees retain their rights under Section 365N, and it, their rights could not be stripped out from them through a Section 363 sale. Now, the court found that the sale of the debtor's assets pursuant to Section 363, and Section 363 has a provision that allows for sales free and clear of interest. There are certain requirements that need to be met in order to accomplish that, which is which are beyond the scope of this program. But basically, um, court looked at that Section 363F provision and uh, determined that it did not trump or extinguish rights of licensees under Section 365N without the licensee's consent. The court found that even trademark licensees, and again, as discussed earlier, trademarks aren't specifically referenced in the definition of intellectual property in Section 365, uh, that 365, Section 365N then takes and protects intellectual property licensees. Trademarks aren't specifically referenced, but the court nonetheless in the Crumbs Bake Shop case found that trademark licensees are protected by 365N despite 
the omission of trademarks from the bankruptcy code's definition. And the court further found that trademark licensees did not imply, did not provide implied consent by not objecting to the sale motion because the court found that the debtor failed to provide adequate notice in connection with the sale motion that the sale was, was, was going to be free and clear of existing licensee rights. So potentially if that had been made clear and if licensees had not stepped forward and objected, it may have worked in the, in the um, Crumbs Bake Shop case, um, but that was not, the, those weren't the facts that the court found in that case. Thank you for listening to this program. There are a number of interesting uh, issues in the intellectual property case where bankruptcy uh, arises. So companies that have intellectual property need to carefully consider and have their counsel, both their intellectual property and bankruptcy counsel, carefully consider the potential implications of a bankruptcy filing. As was exemplified in the Trump's resorts case, the Trump resort case earlier this year, the choice of venue can be very significant for an intellectual property licensee, and that needs to be carefully considered. With respect to the perfection of security interests, best that the parties do a belt and suspenders approach and make sure that they protect um, their interests, perfecting both under state and federal law. Um, if there are questions, please feel free to email me. I can be reached at dcoupets at selmeyerlaw.com with regard to any questions. And again, thank you for joining the presentation.